it's time for another podcast by George. Straight talk, straight from the heartland, that'll have you saying, by George, I think he's got it. Now, here's George. Well, TGIF, good morning, everybody. Hello, hi, how are you? And welcome on in to another podcast by George. We're approaching a very significant, a very important time for me, a date that I never forget. I don't have to mark it on the calendar, folks. I can almost tell from the weather that it's coming up, and it is. It's November 22nd, 1963, the anniversary date of the assassination of John Kennedy. And anybody that was alive at that time, particularly me, a farm boy living out there on a mud road in 1963 and aspiring to be on television and radio and be a journalist and all that kind of stuff, man, it it's something that I'll never forget. It still gives me chills. We're going to be talking about some angles on uh, the assassination that you may not have considered before. And we've got a couple of really esteemed guests coming back on the show today, including Gerald Posner. He comes on uh, once a year, if I'm lucky, maybe two. And uh, this is a great uh, time for him to come back on to discuss this. Folks may know that Gerald Posner is the author of 13 acclaimed books, including the New York Times nonfiction bestsellers, Case Closed, which you'll see if you see full screen on me today. It's just off my left side here today. I uh, love that book. I've got several of his books. Why America Slept and God's Bankers. He is a contributor to Forbes, and Posner was a finalist for the Pulitzer in history. The New York Times said his latest book, uh, Pharma, was a withering and encyclopedic indictment of drug industries that often seem to prioritize profits over patients. It reads like a pharmaceutical version of cops and robbers, and he's got that true crime element in, in all of his books. And pharma, believe it or not, there's kind of a connection <laughs> with the Kennedy assassination and these closed files, and we may get to that. All right, so let me bring up uh, the next guest. We've got two today, and uh, I'm going to be working logistics here behind the scene. And by the way, Facebook's having some issues. I uh, was told by StreamYard that there's something wrong with Facebook today, so if it drops off, be patient. Maybe you have to go back and look for it again, but uh, the show should restart. I may have to reactivate it if it uh, drops off. But Laura Bellin is the uh, author the uh, of Bleeding Heartland. Now, that's a community blog that provides original reporting and commentary about Iowa politics, especially campaigns and elections, state governments, social and environmental issues. Bleeding Heartland also covers what the Iowans in Congress are up to. Uh, and any federal, state, or local policies of interest to Iowa readers. She's been the primary author and sole editor since 2008. And you think, okay, what's uh, she got to do with this? Well, folks, she's the daughter of David Bellin. He was the attorney, one of the attorneys for the Warren Commission. And uh, he's interesting. Uh, not only is he straight out of the heartland, and he's kind of a hero of mine. He died in 1999 at the age of 70. Uh, way too young. Uh, but Bellin kind of went into this thing uh, doing an investigation, trying to find a second shooter. But he came to the conclusion that is shared uh, by both of our guests today. I think I know by uh, Gerald for sure and Laura also that it was just Oswald up there with that uh, Manlick or Carcano rifle. OK, so let me take this off of the screen. Bring me back there. You can see the book off my right side that I was talking about. And let me click. Uh, a couple of things here. Bring this on screen. There's there's our buddy Gerald. He's alive uh, now, and uh, yeah. there is Laura. Okay, we've got all three of us up on screen. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming on here. So I want to, um, and I talk a lot here off the top. I want to get uh, to you straight away, but I always like uh, to play this kind of stuff uh, because it's like I mentioned. For me, it's just chilling. It takes me back. This is the uh, CBS news bulletin uh, and this was really something in 1963 almost on a retro basis to me this is more scary and frightening and makes you snap to attention more than the news bulletins that we get today but here it is we'll bring you details now more details on the attempted assassination of president kennedy mrs kennedy was on her knees we're told on the floor of the rear seat of the car, her head toward the president, apparently uh, leaning over and trying to converse with him. AP reporter who was with the group said that this man and woman we reported earlier were on a hilltop, were seen scrambling to the upper level of a walkway overlooking an underpass to which the car was approaching. Lawrence O'Brien, the presidential aide, says he has no information on whether the president is still alive. 
Mrs. Kennedy was weeping, trying to hold up her husband's head when the reporters reached the car as it dashed toward the hospital. Yeah, so like I said, just from a journalism standpoint, and I'm sure Laura would agree with that. I mean, it's a, it's a chilling stuff for me just to listen to. Now, that was before Cronkite could get on the air. Um, he was in a booth, I think, that uh, they used to make announcements and that type of thing. And I, and I know you uh, covered this in your book, Gerald. Is there anything about Cronkite's early announcements and the coverage uh, on CBS or, you know, any of the major networks that people not, may not be aware of that's worth mentioning here? No, you know, there are just so many moments that day. Huntley Brinkley were the, the duo that competed with Cronkite yeah. on NBC, and they were on just a, about a minute after Cronkite went on the air. I was in the fourth grade, and our teacher at this Catholic uh, grammar school, one of the few lay teachers, Mrs. McAdam, took out a radio and turned it on uh, in the class before they called us to assembly and our parents came to pick us up and you know as fourth graders it was hard to understand what was happening and really appreciate the significance of it except that we were seeing adults like our teachers or the nuns crying that was an indication of how terrible the events were that were taking place and, and you know on a youtube uh, channel i have a little uh, Part where Eric Leinsdorf, who's the conductor of the, the Philharmonic in Boston, announces to the symphony crowd, you only hear it as an audio, that the president has been shot and that they are canceling the rest of the Philharmonic, but they will play Beethoven's funeral uh, march. And you hear the gasp from the audience. Uh, we see, you know, pictures of people gathering around a blind beggar in, in Times Square trying to listen to his radio. He had a radio. There's some remarkable moments that day pre-internet before we could get breaking news on the Twitter, where we got news the old fashioned way. And when breaking news really meant breaking news on that day was seared into all of our memories. So those of us who were alive. Well, Laura wasn't seared into your memory. I don't think because <laughs> you weren't, <laughs> you weren't here yet, but uh, I, um, I, yeah. I heard, I remember my father talking about how he was on his way back from St. Louis to Des Moines after a business trip. And of course there was no internet instant messaging. So I mean, it was something that people were talking about it. The, the word was spreading, but it wasn't something that people could immediately just go and find out what the news was. Of course, he could have had no idea that this would end up being a, a huge event in his own life, as well as a terrible tragedy for the country. And, you know, one other thing I, I was just contacted the other day by uh, somebody who I know here in Miami, who's a physician. He would, turned out he was in the second year of medical school. They were taking an exam at that moment. He was in Washington. His professor came in, didn't break up the exam because they were supposed to run straight through at a time, but wrote on the chalkboard that the president had been assassinated. Uh, that weird. And, yeah. and sort of there was pandemonium in the class. So, you know, so you talk about delivering the news in different ways. The country received it in a way that no future generation ever will. Now it'll come in as a notification on a phone. But there it passed by word of mouth and by listening on radio and television in all different ways. And, you know, TV was uh, kind of, and it's, and you can see that from uh, the clip there, that uh, fledgling uh, early days, people were still relying on radio a lot. And, uh, you know, I, um, I was in a class in uh, third grade and I found out because a teacher came down the hallway with a transistor to her ear, transistor radio crying and carrying on and people couldn't figure out what it was that's that's how she got the news and of course i'm an alumnus of who which was a radio and television combo and uh, they announced it very similar to how cronkite did they had to send maury miller rest in peace into a uh, into an announcing booth where he did the top of the hour id and stuff like that and he was you know he wasn't a newsman but he just read the news and that's how it was heard here locally gerald i'm struck by a couple of things in that very early reporting from cronkite and it kind of shows you how early reports, uh, spontaneous eyewitness accounts can be a little off because they're already focusing on maybe, you know, that couple on the grassy knoll or whatever that was. And, it, and I'm going to get to the, they're mentioning Jackie already. I'm going to get to your recent sub stack because that kind of segues into that, but it kind of shows you how you got to really be patient because early reports are not always accurate reports. As, you know, I'm an attorney also by trade. I know as an attorney that eyewitness testimony, especially on traumatic events, what we call flashbulb memory events, where something happens and, it, it, you know, it sears into your memory and you start to recount what. 
if a traffic accident takes place, a car hits three people, you talk to five eyewitnesses, somebody has the car is blue, somebody else thinks it's purple, they think the car went through a red light or it didn't. So I'm not surprised that the early reports had a lot of information, some of which was right and some of which was wrong. The thing is that people later say, well, look at that early report. That must have been correct. You know, not everything that comes in is. And we know that over time. And there was no question that that was the case on the day of the assassination. <laughs> OK, let me uh, I mentioned this segue kind of to come into this because he was talking about uh, Jackie uh, uh, Kennedy in the car. This is from your sub stack, Gerald. I want to encourage everybody to go there and sign up. Just the facts is the uh, title of it. And um, it uh, is interesting because this is, again, as I mentioned at the top, an angle, something that people don't think about. While the JFK assassination artifact is locked away from the public view, until 2103, which JFK assassination artifact is locked away? Yeah. It's Jackie's dress. The approaching 59th anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy again has historians focusing on sealed government files at the National Archives and whether President Biden will order finally their full release. The National Archives assassination collection, however, Includes much more than paper files, Gerald writes. It also is the repository for physical evidence, everything from Lee Harvey Oswald's Manlicher Carcano rifle to President Kennedy's clothing. Researchers and historians who meet strict standards set by the archives can obtain access to view the physical evidence. Uh, Gerald says, I got permission in 1993, for example, to examine Warren Commission Exhibit 399, the single bullet the so-called magic bullet, the pristine bullet, which it is not, that mm -hmm. wounded both JFK and Governor Connolly. However, there is one item to which no researcher is at access, the iconic pink Chanel styled suit that the first lady wore the day that her husband was murdered. So talk about, uh, talk about that a little bit, Gerald. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know this, George, and Laura knows this as well, that we tend to, people talk about the Kennedy assassination as though it's a board game. Uh, who killed Kennedy, and they, they say whatever they want. And uh, the, we're so focused on the documents, as, and they're important to get all of the documents released. I understand that. But the Jackie suit that she wore that day, that blood-soaked suit, is a reminder of the human tragedy, which we forget sometimes, that you know, not only was it the death of a president and later the death of a Dallas policeman, but that the Kennedy family was torn apart. And uh, Jackie Kennedy was sitting inches away from her husband at the moment that he was shot. She cradled him all the way to the Parkland Hospital, the emergency hospital that he was rushed to in the motorcade on the freeway, the in the convertible at high speeds. It's just they a policeman had to go over to her and and ask her to get out of the car. She wasn't leaving the car nor leaving Jack, who was cradled in her lap. And when the doctors asked her to wait outside of the emergency room where they were treated, no, she said no. She went in with the gurney. She was standing there as they worked on him. And she was covered in the president's blood. And when she was asked if she wanted to change that outfit and clean up. She said, no, I want the world to see what they did to him today in Dallas. And on the way back, uh, you know, she had that suit on when the uh, LBJ w went ahead and was uh, sworn in on the plane on Air Force One before they went back to Washington. And when she went to Washington and was greeted by Bobby Kennedy, her brother-in-law, she had that same dress on. And we know that the next day her personal assistant put it into a box uh, that the pink hat that she had on and the white gloves were missing. They were lost in sort of the craziness of the assassination day. Somebody took them as souvenirs, whatever, or thrown out, we don't know. And uh, that box was eventually moved over to the National Archives the following year. It stayed there. It was never cleaned. The archives was happy it wasn't cleaned because they want to receive clothing that shows the history of what happened. And uh, eventually when Jackie Kennedy died in the 90s, her daughter, her sole heir, um, went ahead and gave the archives the right to open it in 2103, although the Kennedys will be consulted. They've always been concerned, they mean the Kennedy family, that any of the, the blood items um, would become part of a, a gruesome public display. They never wanted to be part of a Ripley's, d d believe it or not, display or a traveling mm -hmm. carnival. It's not going to be that. But I think that was their original concern. And it is this fascinating and tragic piece of history that is there in the archives and will be the last thing that will be opened up to researchers and historians at some point, long after all of us are gone. I want to 
make one thing clear here because a lot of people are joining. And by the way, if you're joining us, I hope it's working on Facebook. Go ahead and make your comments and questions. I would love to hear uh, where people were at, what their remembrances of uh, that day are. Uh, Gerald's heard a thousand of these stories, but he says <laughs> it's it's important to each individual and each one is unique and interesting. But the thing I wanted to make clear here is um, even though uh, that's very interesting and topical because of the date, there's nothing evidentiary. There's nothing uh, that we're going to find out from Jackie's clothing uh, as an example that will help researchers in any way. That's not the point of, of your Substack article, correct? No, no, that that's absolutely right. Um, and uh, and while I don't think in this uh, this is a sidelight, well, I don't think when the last documents are released from the National Archives, um, the remaining several hundred that have never been seen by the public, the uh, then I think that what will end up happening is there's not going to be much of evidentiary value as well in there. But we need to get those released because the longer they are kept sealed the longer people think, ah, oh, they must be hiding something significant. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me bring this up on screen because this, again, is something that affects both of you. Now, Laura's reporting out of the heartland here and uh, from the uh, state of Iowa, but she gets stonewalled regularly on uh, stuff that's being concealed and hidden away and uh, not released and has to go to legal means to get these files and records for her reporting here in Iowa. This is an article that was in uh, Politico. Now, this isn't necessarily anything new, but uh, this is something that probably is the most timely thing, topical thing, as we approach, uh, what, the 59th uh, anniversary here. While we still don't have the assassination files, why we don't have them out of Politico, newly released internal correspondence from the National Archives and Records Administration reveals that behind the scenes, there has been a fierce bureaucratic war over the documents in recent years, pitting the archives against the CIA, uh, FBI, and other agencies that want to keep them secret. The internal correspondence from the archives helps resolve one lingering mystery about the documents. In their negotiations with the White House and the archives in recent years, uh, now have the CIA, FBI, the Pentagon, and other agencies justified keeping any secrets about a turning point in American history that occurred decades ago, an event that has always inspired corrosive conspiracy theories about government complicity. OK, let me take this off the screen. And Laura, uh, just in the state of Iowa here with your reporting, when these records are withheld, does it make you a little extra <laughs> suspicious yes. as, as to why and what might actually be in them? It's it's natural fodder for conspiracy thinking. Definitely. And I remember my father talking about this often that he fought and several other people who were staff attorneys on the Warren Commission fought to have more information released to the public because they knew that concealing the information would make it look like there was a cover up. And I wanted to mention one thing in connection with this bloodstained suit. And I certainly understand why the Kennedy family uh, wants to keep that from public view. But this is an anecdote. It's actually the opening anecdote in a book. Philip Sheenan wrote a book that was in time for the 50th anniversary of the assassination. That is, in addition to being about the assassination, is kind of a history of the Warren Commission. But the uh, Navy pathologist who performed the autopsy burned all of his notes. Uh, he realized, he got home and he realized that his notes from the autopsy of the president were bloodstained. And he said he was worried that some they would become some kind of ghoulish souvenir for people. So he copied, word for word, he copied his report onto new paper. And then he burned the original report and burned his notes. Well, obviously, that is going to make people think that there, that something was covered up from the autopsy. And that should never have happened, even if he had a well-meaning motive to try to, to keep these uh, bloodstained artifacts. So, I mean, we shouldn't let our concerns about um, the gruesome aspects of the assassination get in the way of transparency about a hugely important event in, in American history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and I tell you what that reminds me of also, and uh, Gerald, I, I just saw, rewatched the, the movie Parkland, and it's yeah, it's a good movie on a lot of different levels. Uh, it's historically factual, and most uh, compared to something like Oliver Stone's uh, craziness, but um, Hosty, the FBI agent that was in kind of in charge of keeping track of Oswald uh, down there in Dallas, first thing he did was burn his notes and throw them, uh, put them down a toilet in the movie. I, did, I thought, I think that's what happened. Well, anyway, uh, to Laura's point, this is 
uh, natural fodder for conspiracy uh, thinking. And I don't know. Do you, do you think there was anything there, Gerald, other than him just wanting to cover his own ass with no, uh, getting I, rid of those notes? I think that, you know, one of the things is people did things for their own reasons that later fed into the conspiracy. So, for instance, Bobby Kennedy, we now know, likely reinterred when Jack Kennedy was reinterred at Arlington into, into the grave that he's currently in several years after the assassination. Bobby had the brain, which had been kept originally by the after the autopsy put into that grave with Jack Kennedy. The question of where's Jack's brain was part of the conspiracy theories for a long time until that was answered by Gus Russo and other researchers years later. And I think that one of the things, although Laura's father was too diplomatic to ever say that about the agencies that had been his investigators, the investigators for the Warren Commission, the FBI and the CIA both served the Warren Commission poorly at times. The FBI was desperate to draw distance from Oswald because they had, as Hostie and other agents, an open file on him. So they didn't want anyone to say, oh, by the way, you are the vaunted FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, and you didn't know this fellow was a little off kilter and the motorcade was going right in front of where he was working and that didn't ring bells. So they didn't want to be too close. And then the CIA, of course, um, was not only murky about Oswald's visit to Mexico City just six weeks before, but they hid from the Warren Commission and from, from Bellin and everybody else the idea that they were involved with the mafia in a plot to kill Castro. They were fretting about that coming out. When all that came out years later, people said, oh, there was a cover-up. And I always say, yes, a cover-up of their own bureaucratic reputations, but it poorly served the truth and it fed conspiracies for a long time. Yes, and also Jackie Kennedy was never properly interviewed by the police following that there was so much deference to the Kennedy family, but I mean, she was a key eyewitness to a murder and it's, it's a little bit shocking that she didn't have a full interview, like what yeah. would normally happen in that circumstance. I think that's right. But you know, at the same time though, I think Laura too, I mean, the two things on, on that, I mean, on the one hand, uh, you know, even the night they were doing the autopsy, the doctors doing it knew that the Kennedys that met Bobby, the attorney general and Mrs. Kennedy, they were upstairs in the very same building, calling occasionally down to the autopsy room and saying, you know, when's it going to get done? There was pressure to, to rush it along. But in the trauma and the aftermath, especially when when Jack Kennedy goes on that, you know, that open horse carriage and that public display of great mourning in America. And there there's Carolyn and John John, as he was uh, standing there and he's saluting the coffin the outpouring of real heartfelt grief in this country toward the Kennedys, the trauma of what she had been through were so great that I think that if anyone had said, by the way, let's call her in for a real interview about what she remembers and the trauma of that moment, there just would have been outrage. Mm -hmm. To go back to uh, something you were talking about, uh, Gerald, with the CIA and the FBI, and I think I saw this on your Twitter feed or maybe one of your recent writings, but this, this thing about the CIA and the FBI not communicating, the CIA not talking to the FBI uh, about uh, Oswald or what it knew from the Mexico embassy and all that type of thing. Back in 1963, well, that's continuing. I mean, that is still an issue today, and it was really an issue on 9-11. Yeah, so, you know, I, I did a book on 9-11, and one of the big failures was that the CIA had tracked a terrorist. They didn't know who it was by name, to Malaysia. There was a summit meeting in Malaysia in uh, 99, uh, in 90, late 98, and they had Malaysian intelligence do pictures of the people attending there. They then watched this person come into the United States where he moved into California. Now, they that person then took out a California driver's license. He was living with another Saudi. They were both Saudis. He was one of the pilots on 9-11. The mm -hmm. CIA never told the FBI what they're supposed to do. By the way, we have somebody that just entered the U.S. and is now living in California that we think could be a terrorist. And that's why the questions about Mexico City are so important, because the CIA says, oh, we didn't have our cameras working that day that uh, had surveillance on everybody going into the building. And uh, what about uh, audio surveillance? Uh, we may have had some at some point, but we didn't have any in that period. Did you have any assets working inside the Cuban mission or the Soviet mission? That's what they're still fighting about to keep secret in the files. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I have about the remaining files or what we could have known from Mexico City is, did the CIA know that Oswald pulled out his pistol as the Russians <laughs> have now disclosed, slammed it on the table in front of the Russian 
agent who was responsible for assassinations in the Western Hemisphere, Kostikov, and that the Russians threw him out because they thought he was unstable. Did he talk about or make a threat against Kennedy when visiting the Cuban mission, as has been reported? If the CIA knew any of that, when Oswald crossed back into the United States in early October, it should have warned the FBI. It never did. So if anything, those files could be very embarrassing to what the CIA should have done, but we just have to wait and see again. You know, you've spent decades crossing paths with the FBI and the CIA. So forgetting that connection, what about just the FBI? I keep going back to this Hashi guy because, you know, and I'm reminded again from uh, the movie and in your book. And uh, the uh, he was asked about Oswald and yeah, Oswald expected a big parade when he came back to the United States from Russia. But what a peculiarity this guy was. I think it was said at one time he's the only guy that, you know, ever went to immigrated to Russia and then came back to the United States or whatever. And there was some even newspaper coverage, local small coverage about him coming back to the United States. Well, OK, this guy's working in downtown Dallas. He's in the Texas School Book Depository on the route of the motorcade and out of everybody. And there's lots of nuts running around. I mean, don't get me wrong. But why in the hell wouldn't that ring alarm bells with Hostie and the FBI in the movie? He said, well, you know, I got a lot of cases. I got a lot of things to do. And I look at that and I think, I, I don't know. Are those guys, you know, were they that dumb or were they in on it? What, what do you think of that? No, I, I don't think that I, I really don't think that the FBI knew that Oswald himself was working in the building in which the motorcade was passing in front. So what the FBI would have had to have done the Dallas FBI, they would have had to essentially take all the high buildings, Dow Tex, uh, Dallas, uh, the school book depository buildings along Main Street, and then done sort of a list of everybody working in them and then seeing if anybody had run a file. It would be great today to do that in a computer sense. You could do it fairly quickly, but then it was a manual process. And there is a bit of history that almost takes place. You know, this case is so frustrating because there's so many times you think they're going to get the break. So Hostie is the Dallas agent who's sort of interviewing trying to interview Marina. He gets a note from Oswald that he later destroys and say, hey, just stop bothering my wife or I'm going to come after you type of thing. Oswald's on his radar. But the woman whose house Marina is Oswald's wife is staying with um, outside of Dallas, she finds a note. She sees a note that Oswald has written the weekend before the assassination that he is writing in which he says, I was down. He's writing to the Soviets saying, by the way, Help me, help me get to Cuba. I was just down in Mexico City seeing comrade like Kostakov and I didn't get anywhere. When she saw that, she thought it was a, a, a sort of a, a make-believe story he had come up with. She didn't know he'd been in Mexico City, but she was worried enough she was going to pass it on to Hostie at his next visit. So she was about to tell the FBI, yeah. by the way, Lee Harvey Oswald may have been in Mexico City trying to get to Cuba. That would have set off alarm bells across the bureau but it just didn't happen in time. Mm -hmm. All right. I mentioned I'm trying to, uh, I want guests to uh, weigh in with their comments. I've got one here. I want to bring up on screen and have uh, you guys uh, talk about this. Brad Wolf says, I may have missed this, but I'm wondering if you could comment on Jack Ruby. And of course, he, I mean, he's why we're sitting here talking about this today. Probably his significance can't be uh, overstated on Jack Ruby and his motivation. Since I have always found, that the most troubling aspect of this case, Gerald, just for me and, and reading you mostly, I just looked at it as a guy that was uh, Mushuga, I think is how you refer to it. Uh, a local nightclub owner that was a bully that liked to take matters into his own hands uh, that thought he would be indemnified uh, by his buddies in uh, law enforcement and uh, the court system. And was just to me again, uh, just like Oswald, another nut, and it proves the significance of guns. I mean, just a guy, just a, a nut with a gun, a coincidence. And this is the kind of thing that can shape world history. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I will say that I understand why Brad and I think a lot of other people and uh, my original hesitation about the case before embracing what Laura's father and the Warren Commission had done, when I started to research it, I thought, you know, maybe if there's something there, it could be the mob. And that's because of Ruby. Mm -hmm. Ruby's murder of Oswald. He's a guy that looks like he's out of central casting. He's got the hat, the suit. He looks like a mobster. <laughs> and if you were casting a, uh, an extra for a mob film, you'd have Ruby in it. And it's and to many people, you know, I have chapters in detail and I've studied Ruby. And yes, I... You can understand why he does it in the end, but it's very hard to explain in what I call a soundbite. 
So when you say in an interview like this or whatever, there were two nuts, you know, two people acting on their own that weekend in Dallas. There was Oswald and Ruby. It's unsatisfying to a lot of people. They want to know more than that. It doesn't seem as though that could be possible without knowing, you know, why was the police security so bad? How did Ruby get there? What was the timing? So there are answers to all of that. And in the end, Ruby does, in fact, kill Oswald for his own warped reasons of thinking he's delivering some street justice. There was an unusual rule, a law in, in Texas at the time, murder without malice, maximum five years. That's what Ruby thought he would get at the very worst, and he'd be a hero. Um, but, uh, the, you know, it's a complicated thing. Jack Ruby's a complicated fellow, and I, I curse him all the time because he <laughs> is the reason why we'll never know the full truth because Oswald didn't have his day in court. The evidence wasn't presented. It was in the Warren Commission, but it's different than having it in a trial with the defendant confronted. I want to say also that my father, and this is way before he ever could have imagined that he would be on the Warren Commission, when he saw, I mean, everybody, when they saw that Jack Ruby was able to walk in and shoot Oswald, he thought that somebody was silencing the assassin. I mean, that was the first thought everybody had. So I also understand why people have a lot of misgivings about it. Jack Ruby, he he was a strange guy. He hung around, even though he had mafia connections, he hung around cops a lot. He hung around reporters a lot. And uh, one of the, the anecdotes that my father used to tell about that morning that people don't realize is that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to be transferred well before that event yeah. occurred. Jack Ruby went downtown to do a wire transfer. There is a Western Union. There's evidence of when he did the wire transfer. And then he decided to just go on over to the police station, which is something he did periodically. And uh, the Oswald should have been transferred before any of that happened. But there was a postal inspector who decided to come down and take part in the interrogation. He was involved because uh, Oswald had committed crimes by ordering that rifle by mail. And so his questioning then extended the interrogation that morning and delayed the time that Oswald should have been transferred. So if the mob set up this hit or somebody set up a hit on Oswald, they would have had Ruby or whoever it was in place well before ready for whenever the transfer was going to happen uh, rather than and it, it just was kind of dumb luck for Jack Ruby. And I, I agree with Gerald that he imagined that he was going to be a hero saving Jackie from having to go through a trial and so on. And, you know, Laura, it's very interesting because not only was there a postal inspector arrived that morning. So Oswald was supposed to be transferred at 10. Crowd started to gather outside at 9 a.m. to see the, the transfer take place. One of the things that delayed it is that an armored car was called in to bring Oswald uh, for the transfer, and it was too tall to get into the mm. the, the garage area, so they had to uh, call, uh, call for a second car. That wasn't the right size, so they had to finally get a third car that would be able to transfer him out, so there was a delay on that. And then after the postal inspector left, Oswald at the last minute asked for a change of clothing, wanted a different sweater, so they had to bring him the change of clothing. All of that means that by the time Jack Ruby 200 yards down the street at the Western, the only Western Union station open that day where he's sending a $25 money gram, Western Union money gram off to one of his strippers who had called him that morning and asked for it, walks out of there at 1125. The crowd is still there. He walks down the street just at the moment in which the police officer guarding that entrance moves away because they're getting ready to bring Oswald out. And Jack walks down and walks into history. And he was able to walk in, walk down that ramp, Gerald, probably because the door was unattended. It, it, you don't think that uh, one of his law enforcement buddies let him in, do no. you? So, so this is so fabulous. The Jack was there on Friday, on Friday night when Oswald was first brought yeah. into interrogation. And what was he doing? He's doing what you would expect the Jack Ruby that you get to understand if you, re you read about him. He is a glad hander, a fellow who's always wants to be in the middle of the action. He's handing out his business cards to other to reporters, to a French reporter saying, by the way, when this is all over, come on down to the carousel, the strip club before you go back to Paris. He is bringing in pizzas. He is at a press conference in the back with his glasses on, looking like he's a reporter when Oswald is there because he wants to be there. The police aren't asking him any questions because they all know him. They know Jack. And so the, 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 that was terrible security. On Saturday, the day before he kills Oswald, he's there again. And Oswald, there's a picture of Oswald taken out, being walked down the hallway, and Jack's about 50 feet away and doesn't do anything. And then on Sunday, as Laura says, he's not going down there at all, except he happens to be there still when Oswald's being transferred. So the idea of why there was a moment in the research for the book that I on case closed that I had heard a, 
a, a well-founded rumor, but it turned out to be a dead end. I think, Laura, you'll find this of interest, that the, the police had coordinated with Ruby to take a shot at Oswald because they were furious, not about the president, but about Tippett. J.D. Mm -hmm. Tippett was the first Dallas policeman killed in years. Mm -hmm. And although we all focus on the president, there were Dallas policemen who thought, mostly were Dallas policemen at that time, who thought that the uh, killer of J.D. Tippett was about to be turned over, away from police um, jurisdiction. And they didn't like that. And so I thought it was fascinating that it could have been possible to return with the idea, yes, there was some police assistance, but it wasn't about the president, it was about Tippett. But that turned out to be something I never found any evidence to buttress other than a few good rumors. Thank you for mentioning Officer Tippett, though. That's something my my father often wanted to make sure people didn't forget. And there were several eyewitnesses to Lee Harvey Oswald killing Officer Tippett. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Eyewitnesses, a number of eyewitnesses, half a dozen who see the actual shooter, see the person running away. They identify them to the exclusion of anybody else as Oswald. The bullets are tied to the gun. So the thing that I'm always amazed at is Oswald's very clever. He's pulled off the assassination and he looks like the, you know, the Cheshire cat who's swallowed a canary. He, in those scenes uh, at the police station, he has almost a smirk, but he's pulled it off. He succeeded in the first thing in his life and he's enjoying the moment. And he uses that great word, patsy. Yeah. Now, you have to think, if you're really a patsy, if you've been set up for a crime, you don't know what's happened. The truck runs over and you have no idea and you're, you're guilty and you're sent away from prison for the rest of your life. But with Oswald, everything about him indicates guilt and flight for something no matter what somebody wants to look at him at he's leaving the depository he's returning to his rooming house he's getting his pistol he's killing a dallas police officer he's struggling with the police when they they try to tackle him everything about oswald's movement from the moment that kennedy is killed tells you that he has a role in the murder of kennedy now i believe he's the only shooter laura believes that her father came to that conclusion but even if you want to say he brought only the assassination rifle in or whatever, fine. But when people say he's just a patsy, he's an innocent person, he had nothing to do with it. I say, well, then explain the murder of Tippett and what happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, the foundation of Case Closed, the book. It's all about Oswald. And uh, Laura's father came to that same conclusion. He started looking into this thing. Oh, my God. It's, uh, it's all about this guy. People say that maybe watching, okay, well, Oswald did it, but he was uh, part of a conspiracy. Well, this was a 23-year-old ne'er-do-well, a screwed-up kid. I think he was kind of a forerunner. I don't, nobody would talk about this, Gerald, but the way that I think of him is this is somebody that had bounced around from a broken home, had never been in school, never been educated, really. But as you mentioned, he was clever. He had been self-educated, kind of like a lot of people today that are self-educating with all of these scurrilous websites on the Internet. They're not stupid. Don't make that mistake. Uh, Oswald was not a dumb person, but, man, he was off the rails like so many people are today. And at age 23, Look what he was able to accomplish. And there's one character in the Kennedy assassination thing that doesn't that he didn't get talked about a lot. It's Oswald's brother and his perspective on this, Gerald. And it's covered in your book. Uh, Robert uh, Oswald uh, said that he this is his brother. Now, he took one look at Lee and talked to him very briefly in, in this police station. I think he said, yeah, he did it. I know that he did it. I could tell that he looked at it. And the idea that he was part a secret agent or something like that was brought up by Oswald's mother. And not Robert told her, I guess, yeah, shit, this guy, he, didn't, he doesn't have a pot. I mean, he, th this is not, you think he's a secret agent? Again, it's, it's all about Oswald, who he was. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And you know that I think that um, Os Oswald was explained very, very well in the Warren Commission. Um, uh, Laura, your, your father knew the understanding of you have to understand the person who committed the crime and the why, but then he got lost over the years. As conspiracy books came out, they made Oswald into a stick figure, incapable of pulling it off, and greater forces were involved, uh, and it didn't matter if it was the KGB or the, the Russians or, I mean, or Cubans or CIA or FBI. They all, you could pick who you thought was the mastermind, but Oswald was just this innocent little figure. And one of the things we have is his brother said to me, George, I would like it. I'd like to be able to say he didn't do it. It would be nice to think he didn't yeah. do it, but that's not it. His wife, Marina, who now thinks it's a conspiracy, not based on anything she knows, but from what people have told her, oh, he was a secret agent. At the time she saw him in prison, 
she said when he was being held, not in prison, but in custody, she said, I knew Lee had done it because I knew Lee well enough that if he hadn't, he would have been screaming. He would have said, get me out of here. This is a disgrace. I have nothing to do with this. They've set me up. And he was just sort of like, don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. The thing is, one last thing. We have an unusual thing with Oswald. You're right. He does fit this narrative of this uh, person thinks he's smarter than he is. Uh, a little bit of a loser in life, broken household, uh, uh, odd background. But we also have two psychiatric evaluations. The person who eventually became the killer of the president of the United States, one woman who was just a young teenager. And the, and the psychiatrist remembered it because he was sent for truancy. We laugh at that today. No one would be sent for truancy, not attending school with such a light charge. But it was such a serious evaluation of him having the sociopathic assaultive acting out personality. And then the Soviets did a, a psychiatric exam, which we got released in the 90s that said when he tried to kill himself, we told him to leave the Soviet Union. We did a thing and we came to the fact that we thought he was uh, crazy. And so it's interesting to have these different psychiatric perspectives on the person who ends up pulling the trigger too. I, I think that there's just a lot of resistance to the idea that any one person can yeah. change the course of history. I, I like to compare it to the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. And there's not a whole industry of conspiracy theories because it wasn't successful and Reagan lived. But imagine if John Hinckley had succeeded in killing the president and how many people would believe that somebody did that to impress an actor he was obsessed with. I mean, it's not plausible, right? There could be a million theories about who had an interest, the air traffic controllers or, you know, anybody, right, who had an interest in killing the president. But it wasn't, it didn't change the course of history. It set the, it's, it was a, a major news event that then passed. And so there's, I, I just think that there's a human inclination to want to believe that there are powerful forces at play. I agree with that. And Laura, but one thing also, I think that you take Reagan and you take Brenner shooting at Wallace or you take Chapman killing John Lennon or Sirhan killing Bobby Kennedy. The assassin, the shooter, is tackled at the scene with the pistol. You know who fired the shots. And there's still conspiracy theories like on Sirhan, they say, oh, somebody else, an eight shot. But you know at least the shooter with Kennedy and later with Martin Luther King, you have a high powered rifle from a distance and the shooter gets away in the immediate aftermath of the assassination. And that conjures up all the ideas of Day of the Jackal, a professional mm -hmm. assassin. We're not used to that. We're used to sort of the approach of somebody with a knife or a gun coming up, trying to kill the person. You tackle them and then you figure out, was it a lone assassin or was it a, uh, a conspiracy? So the, I think the rifle shot on its own makes it fruitful for conspiracy speculation. Then you add into that mm -hmm. the murder of the you know, person accused of being the assassin a couple of days later, and you're off and running forever. Mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about this stuff. I mean, I could with these uh, folks all day long. Um, you mentioned Martin Luther King. I, Gerald, I, I've always wanted to ask you this, and I, I've got that book. I've read it. It's been a long time, so I might not be remembering correctly. But I think in that book, you said that you thought that maybe James Earl Ray was part of a, if you want to call it that, kind of a local conspiracy that he may have been offered some money at a like a bar or something like that to uh, kill Ray. Have I got that right? Yeah, I think uh, I think there was a bounty. The House Select Committee got this right. There was a bounty. There a, lot, a number of bounties on King, the Ray brothers. I show you how one of the brothers who ran a bar um, found out about one of the bounties of fifty thousand dollars out of St. Louis, and pass that information on to Ray in Christmas of 67. Ray then suddenly goes from a guy who's taking dance lessons and becoming and taking lessons to become a bartender. He's on the run from the feds because he escaped from prison into buying a gun and starting to track King. And so the one thing for sure is he didn't collect any of the bounty after the assassination. And we know that because when he got to Canada, he was about a hundred dollars short of getting to Rhodesia on an airfare. That's where he wanted to go, White Run, Rhodesia or South Africa. So he had to go to England instead. And the one thing is I was so happy when I came out with that book in 98 because I thought, oh, I finally found a conspiracy, a small kitchen conspiracy. It's <laughs> raised brothers and family, I think, although they never were charged with the crime. But that's not what people thought a conspiracy was. They, I found that out afterwards. They think of a conspiracy as meaning something much grander, not what I think of it as a lawyer, a group of people who may have been involved in killing the president. I would think it's a conspiracy if Oswald was helped by one or two or three other people. But people think conspiracy means a Oliver Stone type conspiracy, you know, hundreds of people inside the secret government or someplace like that, pulling off the crime and keeping it secret. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And you mentioned Bobby Kennedy again, has your position on that changed? You mentioned that eight shot thing. There's still a very active conspiracy community around uh, the killing of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, there is, um, although there are some very, very good books that I think um, uh, settle uh, that uh, question. And um, uh, I reviewed one of them for the Times uh, a while back. Uh, and I think that uh, that I remain unconvinced by anybody that there's more than just Sirhan involved in there. And that you, you talk, Laura and George, you'll appreciate this. You have Sirhan, Sirhan writing in his notebooks for weeks yes. beforehand. Logs. Rob, yeah. Rob, Bobby Kennedy was, must die, must die, must die, must die. Now, that seems, and he's furious over the fact that Bobby Kennedy supported the sale of the jets to Israel over the war, and he is Palestinian. I think that's pretty strong evidence of motive. And yet, people who find a conspiracy say, oh, the, that's so obvious. He's clearly been set up. Who has, so on Oswald, they say, well, we don't find any hatred for Kennedy, so therefore it must be a conspiracy. Then when you find hatred for the the person who's killed with another shooter, they say, well, that's too obvious. Nobody would really write things like that. So you find out that, you Got know, a, another no comment here, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I might make sure that we cover as many of these comments. I think we may have addressed this, but did Robert believe Lee was guilty until his death? What did he say about it in later years? I think Robert <laughs> always thought that he did it. And, and knowing his brother, I don't think he thought he was a secret agent or a part of any conspiracy. Am I correct? Uh, no, that's right. I mean, I interviewed him in 92 uh, fairly extensively, and I stayed in contact with him a little bit after. He always stayed uh, very consistent in that, uh, without any doubt. It was Marina Oswald who changed her mind. But when you ask Marina why do you think that it's a conspiracy, she will tell you a number of things, none of which change what she knows, but it's things told to her by others. Uh, mm -hmm. There was really a secret file, say he was working for, we know he was a CIA agent, things like that. But Marina's testimony against her husband is absolutely critical in understanding why Kennedy died. She's the one who essentially discloses the fact that her husband had in April, only months before the assassination, tried to kill a retired army general, Edwin yes. Walker. She's the one who knew that. She's the one who took the backyard photos, the famous backyard photos of Lee all dressed in black, holding his, his weapon in, in a left-wing journal, the militant. So the things that, that many conspiracy theorists say, that must be fake. It's Marina Oswald who thinks there's a conspiracy today for other reasons, but has never recanted any of that testimony. And okay. I've had people say to me, well, she said all those things in the beginning because she was petrified that she was going to be deported to Russia. All right, let's say that's true. Today, she's an American citizen. She's been living here for over 60 years. She still hasn't recanted any of the very damning things that she says that lead up to Lee and the assassination. So I think that her testimony is still, you look at it, and it's some of the most damning information about why Jack Kennedy's dead. Mm -hmm. There's all these little sidebars. Again, I remember this uh, from your book. I think that's uh, where I read it when it comes to Marina. Here she is uh, pregnant, uh, I think, with, an, with another child. Uh, Lee had her practicing in their living room, um, hijacking what, what he would do, uh, what she would do if they were to hijack. Now, this is a guy that was supposedly working with mm -hmm. secret forces and the CIA and that type of thing. And he's practicing doing a hijacking with his pregnant wife. I mean, a, that's a little piece, a little nugget, but that's very revealing, I think. He, he's trying to get to Cuba. So he decides he's going to hijack a plane and he has Marina practicing. They're living in New Orleans. Then he finally says, OK, that's too much. You're, you're pregnant. You go back to Texas and be there with our friend Ruth Payne and I'll take a bus to Mexico City. And as a sidelight, when he gets on that bus on September 25th, to go to Houston and then a 20 hour overnight bus ride to finally get down to, to on his way to Mexico. That's when the White House announces for the first time that Jack Kennedy is going to be visiting Texas in November. So if people want to think about, oh, was Lee Harvey Oswald part of a conspiracy? He didn't even know that Kennedy was coming to Texas until he returned to America in, in early October, just six weeks before the murder. And any plot that would have brought him in to kill the president has to take place in those next six weeks. They can't do it by telepathy. There has to be somebody that meets him or calls him. They looked at, you know, uh, the, uh, Laura's father was part of the investigation that looked at every public telephone within a radius of uh, the books depository and where the rooming house where Lee lived to, to ask the witnesses who saw him every day and ask Marina, did he ever meet with anyone you didn't know? There is no evidence of anyone bringing him into that plot. And I think that's absolutely critical.
I think I want to also emphasize something that was that Gerald mentioned earlier as an attorney. If you have multiple eyewitnesses to an event, you're going to get slightly different stories. Well, now imagine that you have hundreds of eyewitnesses and hundreds of ear witnesses to the same event that was also a traumatic event for many. So you are going to hear many stories. And sometimes some of the conspiracy theories are built on what one witness or a few witnesses saw or heard or thought they heard. And it's not that those people are lying. Maybe they they did see somebody maybe running away oh, from yeah. the grassy knoll or they thought they heard four or five shots instead of three. It's just that when you have large groups of people, not everybody sees and hears everything the same way. And that's why the Warren Commission did so many interviews and looked at the evidence from so many different perspectives, and we're going with preponderance of the evidence. Yeah, and if I could just add one quick thing, George, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm talking about Laura no, said. No. That's why I think the contemporaneous statements that were taken by the investigators and the actual uh, sworn testimony done by the Warren Commission is so critical because researchers of the case now rely on a statement that somebody has made 10 or 15 years later where their, where their memory has greatly improved. And you know what? You're going to have to convince me as to why your memory got better over time. <laughs> why you remember things you never recalled initially when you talked to the police. Why it's much more dramatic. And, and, and it's not as Laura said that they're lying. You, it, it's called a flashbulb memory. There's studies on this. Uh, and people talk about the case. They read books. They see documentaries. And it becomes part of their own memory. They could pass a lie detector test about it, but it's not credible. So you can't just pick and choose the evidence you want. You've got to look for the early evidence, weigh it, and decide which is credible and what's not and why. All right, I wanted to bring this uh, up on screen here if I can get this to come on. Uh, there we go. I've had this up a couple of times. Now, Laura shared this picture with me. You've mentioned uh, David Bellin. And again, I talked about it a little bit off the top. And uh, Laura's got the, the, the inside track on this. But, uh, Gerald, do your research. Uh, David Bellin is extremely important when it comes to the Warren Commission. Now, again, I may be a, not exactly right on this, but I think of the Warren Commission. And I think about these old gray haired guys that were kind of administrators and appointed that. Then I think of the younger guys running around doing the legwork, coming up with the, all of this investigation stuff. And David Bellin is in that category. He's really important when you think about the Warren Commission. Well, you know, it was the staff that did the real work, as with most big commissions like that, without any doubt. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't Earl Warren, uh, you know, sitting down and going through yeah. every piece of paper and going through the witness statements. And, and David Bellin becomes incredibly important, not just as a driving force, as one of the key forces, I think, in putting together the evidence and marching it and overseeing it. But he's the only voice in many ways for the commission, not officially, but on his own volition, after the case is closed in 1964 officially, and the first of the conspiracy books come out from Mark Lane, Rush to Judgment, and others, the Warren Commission and the government had not built any mechanism in to answer people's questions as they came up over time, which is unfortunate in some ways, but he took that role on, uh, and, and he did it very, very well, time and time again. For decades, you know, I would see him, and he would be the voice trying to bring some reason and common sense into an, an often wildly charged discussion. He, he did take on that role, and it took up a lot of his time. And one of the reasons was that, as you, as you say, the young staff did a lot of the legwork. He was one of eight staff attorneys, and when they informally divided up the work— his main area that he was focused on was the gunman. So he did, he took a lot of the depositions from a lot of the eyewitnesses, people who saw Lee Harvey Oswald in the school book depository or saw him shoot Officer Tippett or people who worked with him at this school book depository. So he really had a great familiarity with the evidence, particularly relating to Lee Harvey Oswald. But yes, I don't know why the other commission members didn't want to be out there publicly defending the Warren Commission's conclusions, but that was a role that my father relished doing. Let me see here. Another comment coming in. Johnson facilitated the CIA under John, uh, George H.W. Bush in conjunction with uh, organized crime. I'm, uh, am I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, Gerald, you... I don't know what uh, Paul necessarily means, but I do know this, that LBJ was aware, one of the few people in the administration, the Kennedy administration, that was aware of the fact that the mob and the CIA were trying to kill Castro. And to his dying day, LBJ believed, he didn't believe the Warren Commission's conclusion. He thought it was likely Castro. He figured Castro had learned somehow that uh, President Kennedy and the administration was trying to kill him. So he thought he'd kill Kennedy first. There was no evidence to that, but the, it, it, Johnson was one of the few who was aware of that. 
Well, we're going to run out of time. I knew that we would, and I could, like I said, I could do this all day long. But I want to get to this uh, angle here at the end, uh, Gerald, about these records still being withheld. That uh, we're still waiting to see this uh, JFK file or, or files uh, that are uh, top secret, confidential, whatever. What's what's the status on that? You know, uh, we're down to they say fifteen thousand. That's the number, but really. That's not quite right, because most of those have been disclosed in the National Archives, but they have redactions, what look like blacked out marks. Uh, your viewers have seen those on documents. The law that was passed after the Oliver Stone film that said everything has to be released in 25 years said it has to be released in its entirety, made no room for redaction. So redacted document, even the name of a 25 year old CIA asset who was hiding, you know, helping the United States in Mexico City in the mid 60s, now in their mid 80s, has to be blacked out. The CIA wants to black it out. They can. But there are also about six or seven hundred documents we've never seen. And those are the ones of interest. Four hundred ninety nine of those are tax records. I know that's hard to imagine, but the tax law says you can't release personal tax files. Um, and although Trump may have something to say about that as a practical matter, that Lee Harvey Oswald's, Jack Ruby's, everybody's uh, tax records are still sealed. And mm -hmm. then there are about 130 documents that we're still waiting to see, which may relate to Mexico City. And Laura, me and a lot of other researchers will say, let's see what, if anything, the CIA knew, if they knew anything more about Oswald being a volatile and unstable character. And what did they do with that information other than keeping it to themselves? Mm -hmm. Has it ever been your experience that uh, somebody like the CIA or the FBI wants these records withheld to protect us? I'm talking yeah. about people, or is it mostly to protect them? I think that Laura will know this from her own journalism. I think sometimes that when I make a freedom of information request for a document that's off their radar, they only are concerned about it the minute somebody asks for it. Then they're wondering, well, why do they want it? What is it that's really important? Then they hold on to it. Then they overclassify. They fight the release of documents. I don't think they are as concerned, and I'm saying this in a broad brush, so there will always be exceptions, about the uh, protecting the public as they are about protecting their own reputation yeah. sometimes. And is there, any, have, is there any possibility that some of those records that Trump took, uh, that he's accused of taking or concealing and still has, uh, has anything to do with the JFK? assassination no, they were at the national archives so whatever oh. he took wasn't it, uh, the i don't think trump's ever been to the national archives you know he's not a, <laughs> well, reader, a researcher you so. have to read yeah. Yeah, that's right so i don't think he's uh, taking any national archives and you know one last thing and i don't know if laura agrees with this or not but my feeling is let's assume for a second there was a massive conspiracy mm -hmm. and there was a document that was a smoking gun that said mm -hmm. by the way remember to do this with a casket and this and that I don't think that document ended up at the National Archives. <laughs> they pulled off the perfect crime in Dallas in 1963, if that's correct. We yeah. can't find any evidence of it. People like Laura's dad and me and others are totally believing it's Oswald alone. So they've done a great job at setting up this uh, case. And then we're to believe that somehow in this perfect conspiracy, someone sent over the key document to the custody of the National Archives. I don't think so. Right. I, I do agree with that. And I think, I mean, it's really unfortunate that the CIA and the FBI weren't more forthcoming with the Warren Commission. My father, during the 1970s, during the Ford administration, he was executive uh, director of the Rockefeller Commission that investigated the CIA. And they were not forthcoming at that time either. I mean, I, I'm i for releasing all of the documents. I, I think when you say, is it possible that they're protecting us? I mean, you could argue if you're going to be the most generous interpretation could be that there might be human assets, like what Gerald mentioned, maybe there was a young person working for the CIA, that person might be still alive, and it could endanger that person or that person's family to have it revealed that they were working with the CIA. But I don't think that that is the main thing driving the secrecy here. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I've got to be respectful of our guests uh, time here, folks. Let me a good way to end here, maybe is this question uh, from a viewer. Uh, they ask, uh, Gerald's book still powerfully stands up. Yeah, case closed, definitely does. Uh, how, and I'm interested in this too, Gerald. How do you respond to critics that you still have uh, when it comes to this and maybe any of your other work or whatever? I, as we get closer to the end here for all of us, uh, what, how do you respond? Well, you know, I don't know if this happened with uh, Laura's dad, but uh, one of the things I think that's happened on the Kennedy case is it mirrors what's happened in terms of politics, how, you know, we're in these sort of two camps that can't stand each other. And what used to be that somebody would come up and they'd 
have some questions about the case and they would think that I was wrong and they'd want to debate it. But it often devolves now into just a name calling. You know, I must be a CIA agent. I must be a front for the government. I must be doing something like that. So I basically avoid those situations. I try to. Um, I'm willing to, you know, talk about the case with anyone, uh, talk about the facts. You may disagree with my conclusions about some of it and think something's still unanswered. That can be debated all day long. But it's, it's become a thing where it's almost like a religion. I think with mm. some people think it's a conspiracy. And when you come in, you're ruining the party by saying, by the way, it's a much simpler thing. Oscar's razor is right. It is in this case, just a lone assassin. They take the great, great umbrage and anger to that. Mm-hmm. Well, and you did a lot of things. You've covered a lot of topics. Laura, this also it would be true of you. Do you, you your, your dad had, a, I mean, he did a lot of things, Rockefeller commission. You mentioned that, but these critics, I, do you kind of view this as an insult to your dad's memory? I'm, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I I used to take it a lot more personally in the 80s and 90s. I regret that my father didn't live to see the pendulum swing back a little bit. I mean, I think Gerald's book was one of the, the first to affirm the Warren Commission's conclusions. That was a, just a really solidly researched book. There have been others written since then. And I think that public opinion now, even though a lot of people believe there is a conspiracy, I think that public opinion now is more supportive of the Warren Commission's findings, the overall findings that Oswald was the assassin than it was in the 80s and 90s. So, I mean, my my father tried to not take it personally, but there were times, I mean, he was even sued by a couple of conspiracy theorists in a defamation lawsuit that was frivolous and ended up getting dismissed, but that took years to get that result. Yeah, the, uh, and one, uh, one last thing, what Laura said, I think after the Oliver Stone film, Mm. 91. The number of people thought it was a lone assassin in one poll was about 5%. In a poll three years ago, um, it was 27% approaching 30. Now that still may seem low to many people, but I was found that exhilarating. Mm. I think your father would have because people have also waited 50 and 60 years, George. And they said, where's the deathbed confession? Where is the person with a guilty conscience who is coming out, who's going to say something? You've had a conspiracy with lots of people involved. And you mean to tell me that after nearly six decades, we still don't have an iota of evidence to support it? Nothing new. And that's why I think more people are coming around to the simpler and the correct conclusion on this case, this terrible case of history. Okay, that's great. Uh, We'll circle back. We'll come back. Laura's on uh, regularly. Gerald, we'll catch you uh, when... We can as we move through our podcast by George schedule here. Thanks again for coming back on the live line. Thank you very much. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and put me back on screen here and uh, mention to folks here as we close the podcast by George.com is your place to go to see people like Pulitzer prize nominated author, Gerald Posner, or to see the great Laura Bellin and bleeding heartland and her recent muckraking reporter we've got that stuff on all the time folks and you can choose a platform at podcastbygeorge.com facebook and youtube are there just click on those subscribe sign up follow us uh, give us a thumbs up or a review and you'll get notified when these live streams are released and then also you can get audio only versions on itunes and spotify deezer iheart radio app places like that it's all at podcast by George. Dot com. But that's going to do it. That's going to wrap it up. That's all there is. And there ain't no more. That's another podcast by George. <laughs>